My name is Peter English. I've been a consultant in communicable disease control since uh, 1998, uh, with a particular interest in vaccines. So I became the editor of a vaccines in practice magazine, uh, and I've been involved in vaccination for some time. And until last autumn, I was the chair of the BMA's Public Health Medicine Committee. Yes, I used to go to the European Society of Pediatric Infectious Disease Conferences, the ESPED conferences, uh, and I'd come back and talk about them. And several years in a row, we were hearing more information about this vaccine that was on the horizon and getting closer uh, to prevent cervical cancer. Uh, and then I came back one year and it was you know, coming on the market. And my then 14-year-old daughter asked me if she could have it. I didn't suggest to her that she should. It, was, it came from her. So I managed to organise her, her first dose privately. I actually gave it myself. Um, and then she had the, then, then the, the programme started and she had the rest of the doses through the programme. Uh... OK, well, we know that at least 99% of cases of cervical cancer are caused by persistent human papillomavirus infection. I'm slightly anxious about the elimination bit because there's the, the, um, there's the up, up to 1% that aren't caused, as far as we know, by the HPV virus, but I'm not quite sure how they see those being eliminated. We have good tests. It's very easy these days with PCR tests to pick up tiny quantities of, vaccine, of virus with a, a vaginal swab. Um, possibly even in due course just in a urine sample, but I think at the moment they're going for vaginal swabbing. So you can detect the virus in tiny quantities. Now, we know that at least prior to the vaccination program, uh, most people would acquire the virus uh, within a year or two after starting to have sex. That was just part of what happened to everybody. Of course, since vaccines come in, the ones that are most oncogenic, most likely to cause cancer, have been being prevented by uh, the vaccine. But there are other strains that are less likely to cause cancer, but can still do so. It all has to do with how long the virus hangs around and doesn't get cleared. Most people, when infected with the virus, will clear it spontaneously. Their immune system will come to recognise it and clear it. Uh, but in some people, that doesn't happen or it takes a long time. Not too surprising if you think about it. That's the same family of viruses as causes uh, warts, the common warts you get on your hands or your skin, or when you get them on your feet, they're called verrucas. It's the same thing. And we know how long it can take for those to, to go away on their own. And what's happening there is it takes the immune system quite often a long time to learn to recognize that this is foreign, something foreign that it should be reacting to and do so. Um, so if you have the virus sitting in your genital tract for a long time, years, um, it can start to cause the changes which start to cause the pre-cancer changes and then eventually cancer. So if you can identify the women who have this virus sitting in their, in their genital tract um, and it doesn't go away, you can then offer them other sorts of screening to look to see if they have precancerous changes or cancer. In, we know that men who have sex with men are particularly prone to anal cancer which is from the same strains as cause you know, cervical cancer. In fact, a higher proportion of anal cancers are caused by the strains that cause um, cervical cancer, the strains in the vaccine. So the vaccine is likely to be extremely effective at preventing anal cancer in men. It can also cause, uh, uh, cause anal cancers in women and penile cancers and other cancers of the genital tract, and indeed of the, 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 the head and neck. You can get cancers in the mouth and the neck, um, caused by exactly the same virus, but the same sorts of reasons. So at the moment, it's both boys and girls. Originally, it was just girls. The hard economics um, favour vaccinating girls because you, you get a much bigger uh, bang for your buck um, it's girls who get cervical cancer, and initially, at least, they focused very strongly on cervical cancer. I think there was a bit of concern at the Department of Health that genital warts were a bit icky, so they didn't want to mention them. Um, 
so they, they focus very much on the, on the cervical cancer. Additional benefit of vaccinating boys was thought to be relatively small, particularly in terms of cervical cancer. Of course, it has a much bigger benefit for um, genital warts. And when you look at the penile cancers and head and neck cancers and the anal cancers, the benefits add up. And it, they decided that in the end that it was, I think they decided it was cost effective to vaccinate boys, but there was also a, an equity issue, an equality issue, and it was perceived as being unfair to protect girls, but not to protect boys. And I think that the, the fairness argument might have weighed in there quite strongly, along with economic arguments there. The one we used initially, when we first introduced the program, was a vaccine called Cervarix, which surprised many of us because it, it, it's only got the two strains that cause the most cervical cancers and doesn't include the, the, the virus types that cause um, genital warts. So it would not have been beneficial in preventing genital warts. When the contract came up for renewal two or three years later, they went instead for Gardasil, which is the one that has had four strains in it, or four virus types, which would prevent the two most oncogenic strains and the two, two causing most of the genital warts. There's now another vaccine on the market, which is also from Gardasil, the same company. This has nine strains in it. So it has the, the two uh, genital wart strains, the two original oncogenic strains, and another uh, three, uh, four, sorry, I can't do my maths in my head. It has another five strains altogether, a total of nine strains covered, including the five next most likely strains to cause cervical cancer. So it prevents even more. They reckon that the original vaccine probably pre prevented about 70% of the oncogenic strains, or the, or the cancers rather, um, and the new one, the nine, the nine valent one, covers about 90% of um, cervical cancers. So the vaccine should prevent about 90% of cervical cancers. Note there's another 10% there that it won't prevent, which is why we need to continue uh, screening. And at the moment, as I say, that's done by HPV uh, testing to see if you have HPV uh, in, your, in your genital tract. The screening is much easier. You don't need to be up on a bench with a with a stirrups and a, and a speculum to take a vaginal swab. It should be a much simpler, less invasive, less unpleasant procedure. And if we can get to the stage where we can do urine samples instead, that'll be even easier, of course. We, we should be able to, it should be easier to do the screening. And 99, at least 99% of cases are caused by HPV viruses. Only 90% can be prevented with vaccination, but the remaining 9% you could, in theory, pick up with, with the screening, as long as people come in for the screening or, or, or send off the swabs. You know, if they do home screening, that's fine. It, it, it's a DNA a, a PCR test. So the swabs, home, home, swabs done at home are simple and easy to do and should be very effective. So we should be able to pick up quite a chunk of that, that remaining 9%. There'll still be the uncatchable final 1%, which may not be caused by HPV at all. I believe the uptake has been fairly good. We'd always like it to be better, and we're always working to improve um, accessibility and availability of vaccination. The main barrier to people getting vaccinated is having difficulty actually getting to the appointment to have it to get it. Um, we won't, we, we, we may be starting to see a drop in cancer cases. We have definitely seen a drop in the pre-cancer cases that we saw. Um, what used to happen was you'd go in for a cervical screen, um, cervical smear test, they'd see changes, and usually they were picking up precancerous changes, and you'd generally have to go in and have a colposcopy test, which means going up in the stirrups with a speculum and somebody shining a light on your cervix and dabbing it with something to show up any abnormal cells and maybe zapping those cells with a laser and things. It's all quite, quite an involved, not very pleasant procedure and quite frightening, um, even though this was precancerous and not cancerous. And the, the idea was to 
to treat the precancerous changes so they never went on to cause cancer. But in themselves, that, that treatment was quite distressing and expensive. And the, the vaccination was expected to have a, an even bigger effect on reducing precancerous changes than actually on reducing cancer. And we've seen that in practice. So many fewer women are having to go through that unpleasant procedure of having their, their, their colposcopies and their cervix, cervixes zapped with lasers and things. It takes time, about 10 years, I think, from the infection and it, to, to go on to can, being, becoming cancer. So we wouldn't expect to see a fall off in cancer until 10 years or longer after we started the vaccination program. And well, my daughter had her vaccine back in uh, uh, um, 2007. I can't remember when it was now, sorry, I wrote it down. Um, in, yes, in 2007. So we're now, we now must be about 14 or 15 years in. So we, we would be beginning to start to see a drop in cancer cases, but 10 years is a minimum and it's often longer. Um, so it, we'd be beginning to see the, the drop off in cancer cases around now. Um, we might not have seen a very big change as yet. Of course, the, the longer it is since you started having sex, the more likely it is that you will already have acquired the viruses. And we had hopes that the, vi the vaccine would be therapeutic. It would teach your immune system to recognise the virus and that would then clear it. Sadly, that may happen to some extent, but not as much as we hoped. So once you've already been infected, um, the, vi the vaccine is unlikely to be particularly useful. Having said which, you may not have been infected with all four of the vaccine-preventable strains, so it may still have some value. And I believe that the current programme allows for women up to the age of 25, or indeed people of both sexes now up to the age of 25, I think it is. You have to check, check to be certain, but I, I think it's up to 25, you can still get the vaccine on the NHS. I think the, it all comes down to cost efficacy and the, the feeling that the, the, the calculation was that most women would already have been infected and if you've already been infected, the vaccine isn't going to help. I remember being invited to an event once where, where they were talking about introducing HPV vaccine in Morocco. And they had a princess from the Moroccan royal family uh, spearheading this campaign to get women vaccinated to, to prevent cervical cancer in Morocco, where of course it's a problem just as it did anywhere in the world. Um, so that was that was a an interesting event. Um, so the, the, it's cervical cancer screening is quite difficult to do. You have to have a good call and recall system. It's much much easier to vaccinate all girls to prevent cervical cancer than it is to screen them through it for the rest of their lives. So if you have to choose to do one or the other because you don't have the resources to do both. Vaccination is the cheaper option and, and almost as good.